I want to do um, the first thing is just to get your name first and last so I have that okay. on tape. Yeah, I, I'm Richard Carson. They know one as Dick mostly. Uh -huh. And uh, where I'm from or what? Well, wait, now how did you get in the service? Which, which branch of the service did you Okay. Have? I spent 24 years in the Navy and then on active duty and in the reserve. And then I got out and I ended up by a fluke in the Air National Guard, Washington Air National Guard, and became their first recruiter and ended up being put on active duty with the Air Force and assigned back to the Guard. So I spent 14 years active duty with the Air Force before wow. I retired when I was 60. <laughs> I figured I couldn't beat it with a stick, you know, it just kept coming back. But uh, So when did you go in the Navy then? 1942, April 1st, 1942. Uh, I, I went in the Navy before I graduated from high school. I wasn't with my graduating class. They graduated in June, I believe. But that was right after, you know, a few months after Pearl Harbor, which is on December 7th of 1941. And uh, I remember coming home with my dad on that Sunday, and Mother was listening to the little old radio we had, and Roosevelt was declaring war on the Japanese, and it had happened over there. And uh, So we were just expected to go. I mean, everybody felt that way. There was no feeling about, well, uh, no, it's not our involvement or anything else. So it wasn't even a question then? No. It was just a... No, everybody. I uh, found out later, uh, out of our graduating class of about, I think there were about 500 in it, I don't recall. For it. But a third of them were killed in World War II. And a third of them became farmers and ranchers in the Montana area. And the, out of the other third, there were a lot of wounded and things that had changed their thing, that they went different directions. But we lost a, a, a good part of that graduating class. And I suspect there were other graduating classes in that time that the same thing happened because we were suddenly got involved in two different fronts and places that we never even studied. When I was a kid taking civics and stuff in, in high school, we never even talked about these countries. Most of the teachers, I don't expect, even knew where they were. When you start talking about the Micronesian Islands and this little island and that little island, and you talk about uh, the Philippines. We'd been involved in the Philippines from way back in the 1800, late 18, but there hadn't been anybody, people there had been a, I met one guy later on that, that had been in a, one of the expeditionary forces in the army over there, but, and that was very unusual. But because we didn't have the newspaper coverage in that days, and the radio was just fairly new, they didn't have people out interviewing stuff. Just what they got over the teletype that came in—that's the way they got the news in those days. And as a result, um, things had happened and. And people weren't bisecting and dissecting the news and everything that happened. That uh, something happened and somebody got a uh, in a radio station that was smart enough to say, "Oh, maybe we should get somebody up there and and talk to this guy." When a dam broke up in the upper uh, and flooded a lot of ranch land in those days, and that that was a big thing because agriculture was the thing that paid all the bills in that country over there. So news was. Slow and coming. Slow and coming. Wow. So yeah. now you you didn't go through your graduation then? No, I never. I I graduated, but they graduated us, all us kids that went in. But uh, uh, I didn't go through high school graduation. No. Well, I didn't even think about that aspect of it. That that must have been um, pretty hard moving for parents and stuff to I'm, go to I'm, the graduation yeah. ceremony and the kids aren't there. Yep, yep. I imagine it was. Uh, I don't remember what my mother said or stuff, um, but they went because somehow I got my graduation certificate. In a little, it's in a little folder, like they, this little thing that they made. So they must have gone to graduation. But by that time, uh, when they gra I was over in Farragut. I was one of the first uh, classes that went through Farragut boot training over in Farragut. They were still building buildings all over the place and everything else when I went through over there. 
so yeah, there was just uh, there weren't very many people at graduation. Were you seventeen, eighteen? I, I was seventeen. I enlisted for for what it, what they it was called a minority enlistment. I uh, till the day I was uh, I got out the day before I was twenty one. So I was a four year enlistment, and uh, I'd always wanted to fly, and so I uh, when they when you went through they sent me over to. Um, on the train to um, Seattle to, I think it was Pier 91 over there, where we took a flight for the night. Thought I had it made. And I was going out the door, and the doc called me back, and he says, no, he says, I can't pass. He says, your nose is just too broken up to, to pass. I had had it broken playing football in high school. And in those days, unless you really needed a doctor, you people didn't go to the doctor's. I mean, I, Dad probably moved it around or did something, you know, and straightened it out. I don't quite remember, and I didn't pass a physical, so I came back and enlisted in the Navy and uh, went off the basic. And then I began to find out there's ways you can do all these things, so I was always one to find out, because uh, I wanted to do lots of things, and, and I've done that in my life. I, if something looked really interesting, well, let's check it out. Maybe that'd be interesting to do. And so we had a lot of neat experiences. Met some wonderful people all over the world doing that. So at this point, it's a an exciting adventure. For yes. You. Yeah. And it's something I've always tried to look back and figure out. But everybody just figured. All my friends, everybody, I just it was something to do. It, we had to do it. And as soon as they announced that we were going to go to war, I remember the uh, the recruiting stations were just loaded with people. And they had all kinds of people that uh, were in their oh, 34, 35, 36 stuff that they turned down at first, but they had more of those than they had young kids at the time. I suspect one of the reasons was that we were just coming out of the Depression. And for people nowadays, they have no idea what it's like to live through a depression. And even my thinking nowadays is tempered by what I went through because I tend to save things. I tend to set stuff so if this is going to need fixing sometime, I've got this board saved or that thing. i got all kinds of stuff to save. My parents were that way. All the old timers were that way. Everybody did. They saved stuff. Uh, we didn't have all the things to eat that we had nowadays. It was pretty tough. I think that, uh, uh, as I said, my dad and his friend, they each put up 300 bucks. They'd saved and saved and saved to go into business. And they managed, both those guys managed, to, we were five kids in my family, and he had two or three, as I remember. And they raised a family on it and did things. They belonged to they went to church. They did. Uh, uh, they were involved in things that happened in the community because they're in business. But they were just interested. Everybody was interested in people because of the thing of the time and the place. They just worked together. You could rely on people. Uh, it always amazed me looking back that if I became a, a miscreant, so to speak, when I was a kid. If you were in the neighbor's yard, they took care of it. You got your butt licked by the neighbor, or three blocks up the street, they took care of you because if you messed around, and your parents never heard of it, you never told them, you just watched your pews. You can't do that now, and it's too bloody bad because of the fact that those people, as they talk to, take, to make up a village and so forth, the people made up the town, and it wasn't a big town then, but we, uh, Everybody worked together and, and knew each other up and down the street. And the and, war unified this even more. And the more. war unified this even more as the war came on because we, uh, the Depression hit, was over back east, but it takes a while for it to kind of roll through the west. It seems like we're always two years behind everybody else it's, uh, when things happen. And so when it came about in 1941, uh, it had never really affected any of the buddies in the West. And the, the price of wheat, uh, they were still having uh, 
uh, droughts around and and stand uh, they, they didn't have the moisture that they wanted in the plain states uh, we were uh, throughout Montana Dakota was always a, a winter wheat area uh, and they relied on snow and stuff in the winter time to get the moisture they needed to grow the crops and if they didn't have it like this year they had a terrible year they just didn't and so people relied on each other and you could trust people if somebody said they were going to do something it was that's the way it was. Uh, you, uh, they didn't keep many accounts. I know when my dad started, people just they, they knew that people owed them and people would pay them when they had the opportunity. They they paid. Uh, the um, uh, so for a, a seventeen year old kid then coming out of the depression and joining the navy. Do you remember what your, well, what you made paycheck wise? It must have seemed like big money. I think I started off at twenty-one dollars a month, something like that. Uh, yeah, and then certain part of it had to be sent home because when we went in, that, that you can you had to make an allotment. Uh, when I, I remember when I uh, I came back from Seattle and uh, went down to Butte and enlisted, and then and uh, then they sent me over to uh, uh, Farragut there. And one of the first things to do in this is making out an allotment to go home. Everybody did that, for to my knowledge. It was just something to your parents or to, for to your parents or to the home, or or if they were married, they had to make an allotment out. Um, that was just expected of you because again, people took care of people. The uh, there weren't a lot of government programs at that time. So you were just expected that if you had old people in your family, you were expected to take care of them. So as a kid, then, it's, um, you just grew up with these things. Now, were you an only, only child? No, there were five of us. I, had, uh, I have uh, two brothers that are still alive and uh, a sister that lives up north here, and she's a retired teacher, and, she's, and my youngest sister is dead. So that everybody's. Are you the oldest? I'm the oldest. So you were the representative. Yes, of the I. I was the one that got met at the door and switched with the switch if the kids got out of line because I was. <laughs> to blame. For I that. was to blame. <laughs> Leadership went downhill from that. Did uh, um. <laughs> did uh, um. So you finally, uh, at first they told you you couldn't pass the physical to become a pilot, but you yeah. f finally found a way to... Well, yeah. After I got in, then I went into aviation, and I got uh, I, I went to uh, aviation, um, AMM, Aviation Machinist Mate School, down in Norman, Oklahoma. They sent me down there. And that was a real eye-opener for me, because University of Oklahoma was a big school at that time. There were lots of people around, and they were just starting the... Um, the south base and I recall taking some classes they bust us up to a building at the university and we took some of the classes up at the university there before they had it where we went through and then uh, there was uh, so many people came through there uh, I met um, uh, people in the entertainment business because they came through and did shows and then they were starting the uh, uh, oh dear, what do you call it? Uh, where they all they got the artists together and they did overseas shows and the USO tours. USO tours. Thank you. Yeah. Oh really? So they you actually saw some of those? Oh companies? yes. Oh yes. And uh, in fact, I took part in some of them later on and, uh, over in uh, Pearl Harbor or at Barbers Point. Um, so then you begin to meet people, and so I found out that they were crying for people. They were crying for gunners. And they were crying for people to, to fly because they just, see, when we went in, they just, they didn't have any of this thing. It was all being built from the ground up. They were trying to manufacture airplanes and they're trying to find, manufacture tanks and they're trying to do uh, ships and all this stuff and get people because people just weren't trained. They didn't have the schooling and the training then that they have now. So as a result, uh, I was going to fly, I'll just go to gunnery school. So when I put in the thing. Then I found out that there was ways to go flying and then uh, I had met uh, a, a guy uh, at, down there that was uh, stationed at what they called the North Base at Norman, Oklahoma and they flew out of there and they had ran training program, flight training and stuff. And uh, 
uh, you're going to cut this tape, I hope. Yeah, yes, yeah, all, right, yeah. all right, well, I'm, because Oklahoma was a dry state. They would fly to Texas to get liquor. And so whatever airplane was available, we'd get in it. I, so I'd go with these guys because I wanted to fly, and I'd go right. And so on the weekends and stuff, I'd go up to the uh, maker and go up to North and then fly down to Texas to these guys and bring back a couple of cases of liquor, you know. And uh, I got flight training this way and then that. And so then I got to go through training at the North Base as an enlisted guy before I got shows. So I got to, uh, I, they had Tim's down there, a little old low wing airplane. It was a monocoque wood fuselage. And I remember you had to land them so carefully because the fuselage would split in the middle and you could see the ground through the through this fuselage if you landed too hard, you know, and the wings spread. And went from there to uh, N3N biplane. And uh, then I got to, got to do other things. So uh, went back to, uh, uh, was sent back to a cashew outfit in, uh, in, uh, Virginia at, um, oh dear, the big Navy, Norfolk, Virginia. We were at a place no, outside of that little town outside. They had an air station, and uh, that was kind of neat because they had they were just bringing in the SB2Cs then, and they were flying this, and so we got to do uh, fly some of these and got time in those. And, and then I met a couple of guys that were flying dirigibles, out of Cape May, New Jersey, and so they wanted to fly in airplanes, and they had been assigned to dirigibles, so we'd swap, and so on the weekend, I'd go up to Cape May and fly in dirigibles, because that was really neat, because they were doing coastal work, and they were, you know, hell's bells, 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour, it's fine, but they'd go fly up the beaches, and so we'd sit there with binoculars and watch all the gals swimming on the beaches, you know, from about 150 foot up and about... 400 yards off the beach out there. <laughs> that was the big thing, you know. That was the come on for the guys. To, and so we worked back and forth. Uh, and, and you were supposed to be watching for... Uh, submarines, submarines, submarine patrol. They had a several air patrol airplanes that flew out there. They had a lot of... Uh, there were a number of women that would fly out, the little old Cessnas and the Cubs that they had and stuff. Well, we were essentially watching for submarines, but... Uh, and all you saw was torpedoes. Uh, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> yeah, girls. Yeah, they'd make the pass down the coast where they swim, and then they'd come back, and th the wind was usually coming in offshore, so it would blow a little. So instead of fighting, they'd just drift up, you know, and they'd, they could beach watch them. So. Uh, there's a lot of things. That, that was one of the things that was interesting in the service, and I, you can't really do it nowadays, although I still think the service is an excellent way for kids to go and learn discipline and respect and some of that thing and how to live with other people. But there were so many things they were learning at the time, and there were so many activities going on that you could do a lot of things. You could trade time, like, learn, like flying in a blimp and stuff. When we had uh, the, uh, uh, in 1974, I had the World's Fair here, I was uh, made arrangements because uh, I was working in the guard out there with the people because I'd had some blimp experience. So I called and that's helped make arrangements to get the blimp to come up here that flew around the uh, World's Fair site. And so I flew a number of times in it out there. Uh, we had a, at Geiger Field, they had the uh, uh, mooring tower set up out there and uh, Met two or three of the pilots, and the people come in and flew several nights and stuff. That was quite a, wow. quite a thing. That blimp here, it was here for most of the fair. It was interesting. It took them uh, for oh, you get me going in all these stories. They were bringing it up from California, and so the, the if the wind blew more than thirty miles an hour, they couldn't fly that day. <laughs> And so they got hung up down at the Tri Cities trying to get up here. They were th they had wandered at a certain date here, and there was three days down there before the wind died enough so that they could come up, fly up to Spokane. Uh, when you when you flew the blimps along the beach, was it uh, uh, just a like two person crew? Oh no 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 no. They had uh, one two three four. They had four crew because they had a pilot. And they had 
uh, another kind of a, 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 a second pilot, I guess, at relief. And then they had two crew because they had an in, they had somebody who was a, a, a mechanic with them because the, of the two engines on the thing, and uh, they had another guy, and then they always had space for a couple of people to ride. Uh, because they were they were on oh lordy they would be gone uh, eighteen nineteen hours uh, uh, you know, on a patrol area then they they were looking through uh, glasses all the time to uh, check for uh, and there were submarines around uh, we heard we heard them but they I never was with them when they saw one of them uh, but they would come in and. Uh, closer to the coast and go out. They patrolled up and down there. But it was... Um, uh, uh, oh, interesting. There was uh, lots of stuff going on because we, we uh, at the Cashew, that's where we were practicing our dive bombing and, uh, and uh, squadron work and so forth. I remember a uh, uh, story that always sticks with me. I, was, I had a duty that day, so that means I had to, uh, I and the guy had to, had to score the bomb drops. They had these targets put on the beach, and they were uh, painted or, or uh, put out so that the center was, I don't know, it seemed like it was 20 or 25 feet, and then there was another ring, and then there was another ring out about 100 feet. And uh, so while the squadron was climbing, getting to altitude, getting up to 12,000 or 25,000, depending on what the thing was to come in to dive bomb the target, and we'd mess around fly around and just look at things and do people and uh, we had some hairy experiences. Young kids doing dumb things, they'd get down and buzz over the treetops and then over the treetops sit down, here's a house right ahead, a big house. And they were sitting down to Sunday dinner and I remember looking in this big window, the window seemed as big as that wall there and here's all these people around and here comes this airplane, I can just see them looking, here comes this airplane over the tree, whoops, what's the house doing and we're starting to go, and people are bailing out of that dining room and going every which way. <laughs> oh dear. And so I, which, which beach is it that you, you put your target on? Was that out uh, off of the uh, off of Norfolk? Or? Out, of, out of Norfolk up under, there were not near the houses on it then, there was all kinds of desolate areas along the beaches. And there were a few houses out there. Uh, we had a bomb hang up one time uh, and uh, on the fork, and it comes down and it's in there. Uh, uh, so this 500-pound uh, bomb will clear the prop, and it's <coughs> safety wired. Well, one of the safety wire they're both supposed to pull loose when the bomb drops, and the and the little uh, uh, cone on the front spins to arm the thing, and uh, so one wire hung up. And so the bomb's hanging there. We couldn't get rid of it. And we were, uh, uh, they didn't have that much explosive in them, but they did have about, oh, I don't know, 25 pounds of explosive or something, and enough to, to mark, you know. All right, so what to do? And they said, uh, we called in and go out and fly out and go out 5,000 feet and go out and then you'll bail out and then we'll have somebody there to pick you up and all this thing. So, okay, we come back and I was flying very carefully and it, and it was kind of bouncy that day and we were at about uh, oh I was about at a thousand eleven 1, hundred feet when 1500 feet when it didn't go so I was trying and so out we go we're going to go out and I turned and turned. all of a sudden the airplane jumped in the air like somebody's playing and the, the bomb fell loose and the kid is riding in the back seat looked back and he says man that's going to hit oh my god <laughs> Hit a cabin, a house down there, and just blew it all to pieces. And, and I looked back quickly, and I could just still see boards look like they were coming up the height of the airplane, you know. And, and, uh, so we had to report the thing, and we were very, we didn't know what the hell, because, you know, we were trying to do what we were told, but things happened. And uh, I don't know what ever happened. I remember that, that uh, the last I heard, that old shack had become very expensive to the Navy, you know. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. <laughs> there was nobody in it, thank God. But it's just one of those things that happened. And that, uh, so you actually were dropping live. I mean, they were less charged, but live. Yeah, rounds. yeah. Because we dropped. Uh, we practiced with uh, twenty-five pound um, bombs, small ones, because they 
they didn't have the country didn't have the wherewithal at that time to let you use real big live ammunition because that was always having to go overseas or someplace to the, but we practiced with the smaller stuff. Wow, that's one of the things you forget about is that, yeah. that, that there was all this training going on, yeah. and which yeah. must have been, I mean, if you lived in the Norfolk area. To... Oh yeah, because it was growing like mad, and the uh, and the uh, basin where the ships were was growing like mad, and they were building ships, and they were they had all up that river. They had this kind of a base and that kind of a base for. Uh, uh, they were beginning to put things together to uh, to assault the beaches with, you know, and train people to do that. And uh, gosh, there was so much going on that it was it's hard to remember. So at this time, you know, you're still a 17, 18 year old kid, yeah, kind yeah. of having fun. I mean, yeah. it's pretty exciting stuff. Well, yeah, I'm very young, and I haven't experienced all the experiences of life, you know, like the kids that lived on the coast and stuff. They had some of these uh, places to go to for what disco places you call them now. We didn't have any of that when I was a kid growing up there in, in Montana. They, and so it was kind of neat because I got back to the New York area back there, got to go to Radio City Music Hall, and I saw Frank Sinatra on his very first program when he was just a young guy come out and, and sing, you know. Uh, we, uh, and I had a good time. I got there and I called up all the Carsons in the uh, phone book in New York, and I don't remember, there weren't very many at that time, uh, to see if I was related to anybody. Because my folks had never really talked much. About, my granddad and grandmother had done this, and my, my granddad on the other side was a, a, a builder, uh, was a property agent for uh, Jim Hill, and he, came, he bought property all for the Great Northern, all the way from Minnesota out through Montana. That's how he, how he got to Montana. And so these are just family things that they just kind of mentioned in passing. That it was, and so I was really interested, and in, by that time, getting interested in where I come from, because my grandmother, had, I knew she they'd been in Appalachia, and they'd been down at Arkansas, and they'd, they'd come from Nova Scotia and, and from uh, uh, Scotland and some of these places. So I called up people on the phone, and I got invited to dinner. I think I was there four days, and I, I got out to dinner a number of times, five or six times, got invited to people's house, and they were just as open. They were friendly. You know, to find out here was a Carson from way out in the Wild West, you know, and what was Montana like, and what was it like, and, and they had heard these stories, and here I was in New York, and... and it was a hell of a big outfit, boy. Now, did you travel in uniform most of the time? Yeah, we, we the... had to travel in uniform at that time. Yeah, and, that, and, and I assume that the respect that you got. Yep, was, uh... yep. They, uh, you got respect from uh, the cop on the beat. If you stopped asking questions, he was very respectful. And uh, they didn't uh, kick you around. And there was lots of all kinds of servicemen around, all kinds of foreign servicemen around. Met uh, Englishmen and Frenchmen that were around, uh, and so it was a real eye opener what was going on in the rest of the world because you were meeting people who were just like you had come out come from a family affair, a small business in a small town or something, and had like experience that so they'd gone to school or did this, and so it was kind of fun. Uh, they were having trouble learning to speak English. And we were picking up all kinds of foreign words that you don't didn't want to use at other play times, you know. That's the kind of language you learn the first and the fastest. <laughs> so, so when did uh, when did life change from being this well, go lucky? When we got when I went aboard the Ticonderoga, and that was the aircraft carrier we were assigned to, and then we went through uh, the canal. And, uh, and that was the experience, taking that great big boat through the Panama Canal and all the things they had to take off it to do it. And then we got out and went to... Uh, it was always amazing to me. Uh, we loaded uh, people and uh, other Air Army Air Corps groups and other Navy squadrons onto the carrier. Where we were used as a transport from San Diego all the way to Pearl Harbor. And we, I never forget, they took this army group with P-40s on board, and they had all, they slung the airplanes and put them on. And, and these guys had all been outfitted for the South Pacific. They had on the, the short pants and the, the socks that rolled up and all this stuff. And we got to Hawaii, and by that's when the, the Japs attacked uh, Dutch Harbor 
up there. And here these guys were outfitted for the South Pacific and they got shifted to Alaska. From there up, something picked them up. And I uh, never did find out really what happened, but I always felt sorry for those guys. That, uh, they were going off to, to uh, Guadalcanal and some of those places and went up there. Uh, and then uh, you begin to meet people. Uh, we went to Barber's Point. I mean, that, that we flew into there. And then, well, the ship was loading off the stuff. And, uh, excuse me, we didn't fly into there. We went there for some training and so forth because they unloaded airplanes off the carrier with uh, cranes in it because we were just chuck a block full. Uh, and then you begin to meet people that had experienced being in combat because of the hospitals that were there, the big Navy hospital and the big Army hospital at, uh, at, at uh, Hawaii. And you'd meet people and they had all these ships that were under emergency repairs there and from various things that had been. And that's when it began to realize that uh, things were going to be different. Uh, they gave us briefings and they tried to tell us uh, what the scoop was. And then uh, it uh, wasn't very long and we had our assignment and off we went to do our thing. And uh, since I was, uh, and, I, and, and, and I would had become a rated enlisted pilot. And at that time, it was interesting to me looking back because I, I uh, like kids, a lot of them, a lot of them did. After we came back out of the service, then we went to college. I would never have been able to go to college if it hadn't been for the GI Bill because coming parents coming through the depression, and all that just were not able to save money, and only the fortunate few were able to go to college in those days. And as a result of the government with its program, I was able to go to college. So. Uh, that that made it neat, and so when I went to college, then I had an opportunity to be commissioned, and took thing, took tests up, and was commissioned. Uh, and I had had a chance while I was in the service to uh, uh, I uh, wanted to go to the Naval Academy, and I took all the tests and then got uh, put on the list. And so the way that was then, uh, they had. You had three, one, two, three people from each naval district were on the list. And so you worked your way up to number one, and then when they, because they took so many enlisted people, they still do, into the Naval Academy, and they take so many appointees by uh, political people, and there's so many that get to go because their their fathers or somebody that were award winners like uh, uh, Oh, the uh, f top award, the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winners and uh, stuff like that. They, their people get to go to the academy. So they about a third of the class is made up of people from the services. So you get on the list, and then I get transferred Naval District. And so then I go back to the bottom of the list, and then I got transferred Naval District. So I never made it to the academy, but I was always on the list. <laughs> But what it was, was it like being on the, the being on the Ticonderoga? The Ticonderoga. I mean, that must have been. It was a it was a um, the biggest carrier, one of the biggest carriers at the time. They were uh, what twenty seven thousand ton or something. I've forgotten right now. That was uh, she was CV fourteen. Uh, there were a lot of people. They the normal crew was. About 3,000 people, but in wartime they had a lot more people on board. Uh, when she got hit, we lost a lot of people on it. Oh, you were on it when it got hit? Yeah, you know, and uh, the because uh, 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 they, they had all kinds of people, you know, photographers mates and they had all kinds of cooks and they had all kinds of yeomen they had all kinds of uh, mechanics of various types to to repair airplanes and to fix this and fix that and so forth uh, because they carried uh, they carried uh, big squadrons uh, they had uh, uh, a fighter squadron a torpedo squadron and then a dive bomber squadron on board and then, and they were Oh, I've forgotten right now. It seemed like there were 18 fighters and there were something like 12 tor torpedo airplanes and uh, uh, 
probably 18 dive bombers. So it's uh, a city. Oh, it's a huge, humongous city, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't even, yeah. even see everybody. No, no, you never did, because you stayed in your own compartment. They didn't really want you wandering around on the ship because you never knew when you had to go to general quarters or something happened, and then so you... You had your own area and you kind of stayed in it, or you they had a library on board you could go to, and but uh, if you weren't busy, you could stay up on the uh, out of the way up on the flight deck and so forth. Where was your area? Uh, well, I was in flight quarters and then and and uh, with the uh, air, uh, aircraft crews and this type of thing. They had their own area on board the ship. And flight quarters is is up. Well, yeah, they, they, the ready rooms were right under the flight deck. They had them uh, uh, different places on the ship. And uh, then the, uh, the pilots had their ready room, and the enlisted had their ready room, like the gunners and the torpedo men and stuff. And the, the pilots would go up, and, and they went through their, their ready, and they, were, they got their designation and targets, and they got the information that they had to have for radio calls and all this stuff. And so did the enlisted people. They, they got, because they all had separate jobs to do. And they reminded you of safety practices and uh, safety things in case you got hit or in case you had to do this or in case you had to do that, uh, this type of thing. Um, and what to because the um, enlisted guys the the rear seater in the uh, like in the dive bomber I sure he had he was back there with a couple of twin thirties and he was supposed to look but he had other things he had to do because he was had radio business and he had thing and he had to observe uh, because you'd never know when you got out there you'd see ships on the surface and you may have gotten a briefing that it said this and that and the other thing. Well, when you got out there, it wasn't like this, that, and the other thing. There was something else, and they had to repeat. Uh, I know later on, uh, I was when I was involved uh, in intelligence, the uh, after uh, when Korea was on, one of the fascinating things to me was when they found out that the North, uh, that the Chinese were involved in Korea, as two young pilots came back from a run. And they talked about seeing these two hump camels when they were at the debriefing, and they just thought they were nuttier than heck. What do you mean two hump camels? Well, they were hauling this stuff up over this pass, and we flew over, we flew around, went to look, and they shot at us, and we got. And that's when they found out that their first physical evidence that the Chicoms were involved in Korea. Boy, and if they hadn't reported that, if they hadn't reported that, they would not have. And so this is one of the things they, they talked about because you got intelligence briefings. So what was supposed to happen here and keep your eyes open for here. And so which plane did you end up flying in? I was in the SB-2Cs, the dive bombers. And that's a, a two-person? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it was a big old pig of an airplane. Oh, excuse me, I'm not supposed to say that. for, But um, we were fill-ins. When people got uh, people got shot or killed or something, you know, because the Navy believed that in order to be an off uh, in order to fly, you had to be an officer and a gentleman. See, I have a commission from the Navy that says I'm an officer and a gentleman. That goes back to Revolutionary Wars. They don't do that anymore. Oh, really? No, you're just become an officer. So I don't know when you left. Forget off being an, a gentleman. But I remember uh, back there, oh, let's see, this I was in 48, I got commissioned. Uh, yeah, when I went to school the, uh, at the University of Montana, uh, things were still coming out of the war. They, they were still stuff. And we, you got to understand that we had never been involved like this before. World War I was a different kind of a deal. And airplanes were just coming in, and they had a certain kind of people they were looking for to fly them. Uh, they didn't go with a mass recruiting thing all over the bloody country and say, we want you for Uncle Sam's Navy or for this and stuff. So people were not cognizant of the of the uh, all the problems and the things, and 
the military still operated from the days that the Revolutionary War through. There was lots of things that they, uh, the military was run by good old boys, just like people that got involved in the government and you had a job and you stayed with it and you stayed with it for, it's not like that anymore. And I feel sorry for some of these kids that they, they go to school now and they may have eight or 10 different jobs in their lifetime because they have to in order. But in those days, people expected to go to work for a company and they were going to work for it for their entire life. The, the motor companies, the, the, uh, all the agricultural type of companies, uh, farming and this type of thing, that, that's what you could expect because that's what had come through. And then World War II changed all that. One of the things I think, because all these kids were allowed to go outside of their country send to foreign countries and see how other people lived and found out that they were a pretty select group here in the United States compared to what the Philippines were or those people in the Micronesian Islands or down at uh, uh, New Zealand or Australia or some of those places. Uh, they just had no concept and most of the people over here had no concept what it was like to live outside the country. Well, even the fact that you lived like in Montana where you did, we had no concept of what was happening in Washington. Seattle was like a foreign country. Uh, New York was like a foreign country. People didn't travel there, they didn't have the money. And a very few that did, they were kind of select people, they were kind of the haves and there was 98% of the have-nots out there, but it's not like that anymore it would, because there's all kinds of opportunities out there for people. So World War II opened up. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it's interesting because it, th there's kind of this, uh, I mean, there's the, the bad and the good and, and from war. I mean, there's a travesty of war. Right, right. But there were all these things. I mean, you talk about the GI Bill. You talked about opening up a whole new world for you, a That's geography right. lesson you probably right. had. And sending, and for example, my first look at a college was the University of Oklahoma at Norman. Tremendous place. What did they teach? They were in, uh, their big classes were in oil, uh, petrochemicals, and so forth. I'd never heard of petrochemicals. I meant anybody was a petrochemical engineer. And here were kids going to school. So it opened your eyes up. Uh, we stayed until I got to, until the barracks said we were housed with uh, civilian people down there. And I stayed with a neat family. I became so enamored of those two girls in that family. Their father was a cotton grower. I worked for the Oklahoma Cotton Growers Association. And these two gal, one gal was Miss Oklahoma, and her sister was younger, and they were a church-going family. Well, I, my family had been church-going up there, but I didn't think much about it when I got in the service. But I got down there, and they expect me to go to church with them. And this was a whole, because I went to a different church. I'd been born and raised in the Presbyterian Church up there, and got down there. It was a whole different thing, and it was, and it was an, it was an education that gave you an opportunity to evaluate people, to see people, and find out how they were. He was the neatest guy. I, my dad sent me down my shotgun so I could go bird hunting with him down there, and then uh, it was just neat. Uh, so when did you? Um when did you see your first action then? You were sent South Pacific, right? Yeah, we went, went South Pacific and uh, we, uh, well, we got attacked by uh, some Japanese air. We had a kamikaze hit the carrier and uh, did some extensive damage, went into the, dropped the bomb, and then went, and then went into the after uh, hangar, uh, hang, uh, uh, elevator on the thing. And uh, they were, uh, we were refueling the airplanes, and we had uh, on the second deck down, we had uh, the bomb trailers all hung out and rockets on them and all this stuff. And so when stuff started, you know, this stuff started setting this stuff off, and it was whipping down the deck just knee high. It come these uh, rockets that we had, uh, and it caused a great deal, and then the fire, and a great deal of havoc, and so forth. We lost a lot of people on board the carrier. So that was your first yeah, yeah so you didn't I mean because a lot of people kind of gradually got introduced to it I mean you're well, we, we, yeah, fireworks we, yeah we were we were in a group and we were out looking for and um, uh, we'd been working over uh, Japanese convoys um, they were going down because they the Japanese had extended themselves clean down into into China and and uh, 
and Borneo, and, and uh, they had bases and stuff all over there. They'd been building up since way back in the 30s, and nobody here, there were a few voices that tried to tell, but nobody here really realized until we got involved that they had all these little air bases and all these little naval bases uh, strung out all down through there, and that's what uh, made it so tough because they had been there and had established bases, and so they had uh, some roots there. And we didn't have a thing, and so we were trying to go in, and, and uh, they had this, this whole string of supply, so it was hard to penetrate it, so they were after uh, our, our oil tankers that were refueling the fleet, and they were after supply ships, and, and we were, had all this stuff going out there. And uh, so we were after convoys to uh, uh, the supply ships and so forth. So was it uh, daytime or nighttime? Yeah, it was daytime when we, yeah. But, uh, uh, they they didn't do, to my knowledge, now they they, they didn't do a lot of nighttime operations because uh, uh, not like they fly off the carriers and stuff. And there was no, we had no way of landing on a carrier at night then because we depended on the landing signal officer in the back with his flags to get you on. Now they got a ball system and you can fly right down and it flies you just like the Vassy lamps at the airport and this type of thing. So uh, most of it was, we would take off, uh, we'd be up like 3.30 in the morning and then we'd be take as soon as it was daylight, maybe um, uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock, whatever, you could take off at daylight to do your things. And, and uh, the range was, oh, 400 miles at the most, maybe 450 sometime, because you didn't have that, they didn't carry that much fuel in those days to go. Uh, and they were, they were still learning, because uh, Lindbergh was the one that showed them how, when he was down at Guadalcanal down there, showed the uh, Army how to conserve and set the throttles on the engines and stuff to control fuel, but they were just learning all this stuff, because the, you gotta understand that we had never, been a technological country before that. And here we're suddenly thrown in with all of these things. You had to have all kinds of engine experts. You had to have metal experts. You had to have, uh, they didn't know much about plastics in those days. Uh, Bakelite had just been invented some while before, as I recall. So we didn't have a lot of things of plastic where they're all made of metal. All the uh, 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 to pipe, pipe tobacco came in metal cans. It was not in paper products or anything like that. Uh, so the whole technology was changing. And trying to keep up with this, some people had at the various universities had studied some of this and they become experts in the military and, and the government used them to go out and teach all these people all over. And they were trying to teach people, other people this so they could go out and clue the people in. Uh, our mores were really interesting. I remember when they were, took over some of these South Pacific Islands, the natives down there all used to run around, just uh, uh, had uh, uh, loincloth on or, or something, and the women ran around, they were bare-breasted and stuff. This is a mark of beauty, that, and that's the way they did. And we got down there and our chaplains decided that, hey, we can't have all these bare-breasted people running around out here. We issue them T-shirts. So they, they got to scrounge around and get all these t-shirts for people to wear. And it wasn't very long, a couple of days, and the t-shirts the, the are cut out and their breasts were hanging out of them because that was a whole different thing. We weren't used to thinking that way. We didn't look, we were a, a, a hidebound uh, community up here that, that uh, came from the old days, uh, the religious days and stuff, and stuff was going on around, we had no bloody idea. And that was just one of the things that changed. Uh, then uh, uh, later on after I got put ashore at uh, Barber's Point, one of the things that I, the job I was given was to run the outdoor theater and the indoor theater. And the outdoor theater, well the indoor theater was used for, uh, because they didn't have a chapel on base, it became the chapel. So starting on Thursday night, I had a crew of four or five. We had to set it up for this kind of Protestant service or Jewish service or this and do this. And so all the way through Sunday, it was various. And I met all kinds of wonderful people. 
from various religions and what they practice. It was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, then with the outdoor theater, uh, we had all these programs that came in. I met Bill Cosby and his band were there, and uh, who was the guy that took over Bing Crosby? Not Bing, uh, 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 Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby. Uh, yeah. the, but no, the uh, Glenn Miller, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, uh, Tex Beneke. Uh, so we had all kinds of people, and I met lots of people, and I had lots of friends, and and the USO shows came through there, and the gals came through, and we had it fixed up. And it was real fun for me because these people didn't have nothing to do when they weren't the show weren't on. So they sit there and they like to love to play poker back there. And they, and here's these Hollywood movie stars and stuff. And we're back there, and I sit in and playing penny ante poker or, or playing bridge, you know, and stuff. Uh, the because uh, it was really interesting. And I was fortunate in that uh, when I got to Hawaii, uh, my mother had an uncle that worked for the Honolulu Star Bulletin, and he had married a gal. She was one of the bishops the original, from the original missionary family, and they had a really neat house on uh, up in Haleawa Drive, uh, up above Punahou School, and you could look down there. Uh, and I loved to go there and, as when I could in the weekends because they had, had they had a sailing boat. It was a double, what they call it, uh, Norwegian double ender it was a, uh, at both ends. It was about a 45-foot... And of course, then I was a bloody hero because I had a way of getting away from Pearl Harbor in the weekends and stuff. And because of my connections in the Navy, we could get some fuel to run it and do this thing. You know how it goes. <laughs> and so we'd go out, and I, and I always had, I had everybody from Admirals all the way down wanted to go out with me on the weekend just to get away. You know? uh, so once in a while, we could do that. You couldn't do it all the time, because they were, but it was neat. And they lived up there. And the thing that really came home to me was that um, he, they had this Japanese couple working for him. And he, uh, I, I met him, and I didn't know him that well, but I'd seen him eight or nine or ten times. And then I went there once, and, and uh, he was gone, and she was gone. And I asked uh, my uh, uncle, uh, what, well, the... FBI picked him up. Well, what had happened? He didn't know it. This guy had been reporting since before the war. He had a little radio set up in the uh, attic of my uncle's house, and he'd go up there and he was telling, he was reporting things to the Japanese through the radio system, and even before Pearl Harbor, they were doing this. Uh, my uh, Aunt, uh, his wife taught at the uh, taught art and some other things at the University of Hawaii. She was a, really an artist, and uh, they toured the world. And she did pictures. Of, and then uh, he had worked for a long time for the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Out, and then he was, I believe, at that time he was purchasing agents and working at the Department of the, of the University of Hawaii. And uh, they knew a lot of people. But it was really fascinating to me that I actually knew a spy. And he looked just like you and I, only except he was Japanese. And he was smaller and so forth, you know. That, that thing. But, and that's what he did. And my uncle never knew that this little radio thing was operating up in the attic of, of his house there. The FBI came out and got him? They, they found through tracing and, then, wow. and so forth uh, how. how. Uh, but that was interesting to me because there, uh, the governor of Hawaii lived up there, there. And that's when I began to get more history of what the bishops had done to Hawaii and how they had taken over and, and uh, usurped uh, property and stuff in there, you know, good uh, Protestant missionaries doing this type of thing. Uh, so it was quite an education for this little kid from <laughs> Montana to... <laughs> So where did your where did your um, tour go then? What what areas did you see when you were out? At? Oh, we uh, uh, were with the uh, oh dear, I forget the uh, carrier that got hit. The uh, started with the, started with the big E. Uh, I'm drawing a mental blank right now. That's okay. But uh, oh, we got off the Philippines. Uh, I was involved, and in what really amazed me, and MacArthur all the time he was on uh, 
the Philippines before the war, they never took any pictures of the place to speak of. So here they are, they got kicked off by the Japanese and they're going to have a landing and go back and take back the Philippines and they have no idea about the beaches or anything else. So we got involved in photographing the beaches, fly in at certain altitude and they had cameras that took pictures and this type of thing, how the uh, uh, water was running in, you know, and, and, the, and the wave action and stuff. Um, it just amazed me the things we ran into out there that nobody had given a darn about before. And so when, when Korea came about, before Korea ever came about, they had people from the uh, Navy over there taking pictures in Saigon and stuff because they were developing uh, information sheets. So if a pilot got shot down when he was brief, here the to go see this person. Here was some money. We, we always carried uh, uh, after after World War. Well, maybe even during World War II, certain places they went. They they gave them things. But after that, they began to put maps in in uh, in the coats so they, in the in the back of your jacket area. Uh, they uh, if you uh, were sent out on missions like in Korea, stuff so you had money. So if you were shot down in the area, you had some uh, stuff. Uh, so they didn't have any of these maps? No, no. So now they got books on board the carrier so that the briefing officer and the intelligence officer, if they're sent, let's say, for example, they may be off to the uh, uh, Gulf to uh, take over and, and uh, operate in the Gulf when something happens down on the Horn of Africa and that carrier task force is diverted down there and they're going to send airplanes in to do something. The carrier's got a book of that country and all the people and everything else in it. it helped develop this over later years and in the intelligence. But they, they didn't know these things then. This is all what's come about since then. And uh, the fields are so broad. For example, when I went to forestry school, there were five degrees in 46, 78, 48. What they, they got 15 or better now. You know, and other fields are exactly the same way. When I went to forestry school, they had no idea about recreation in the forest. Hell's bells, no. That was the farthest thing from their mind. They were selling property and trying to, people wanted to build cabins and they were trying to do all this stuff and everything. Uh, now it's comple completely different. And, and they've got technical fields now that they never even thought of. In electronic, micro, macro electronics, holy smokes! So it sounds like your view of World War II. We were kind of inventing things as we went yep, along. I yep. mean, we were making it up as we were making it up as we went in a lot of areas. Uh, probably the biggest thing for the kids, though, the, the, the young kids, that was getting away from home, seeing that there was another world out there, that all the things that they had been taught and done when they were kids sustained them out there if they followed their uh, the precepts that their parents and talked about and so forth that that they were going to get along all right because most of the kids in those day and age were more self-sufficient than a lot of the kids are today because of that family ties and the backgrounds that they had that they went through so you were able to uh, take care of yourself uh, I don't know exactly how it is now, but I know then that most of the kids went to church on Sunday in the service. They just went because they'd been doing it when they were home. Uh, now, are you one of those kids that, that left a, a, a young boy and, and grew up in the, in the service? I mean, was that... I, I grew up in the service, yes. Uh, I was a young, innocent... Flatlander, as I call it, but you got with the others, and you and uh, I saw right away that you had to study when you were in there. If you wanted to do something, the opportunity was there, but you had to prepare yourself for it. Uh, learning math to navigate, uh, learning to read at, at, uh, uh, English, at, and, but learning to understand foreign languages, and and when people talk to you, what they meant by 
actually looking at them and seeing what they were trying to converse to you by their look on their face and their, their hands. and, and the, uh, it, it was a, a real learning experience. Uh, and I've always felt it was probably the best. Uh, I look back and I think and all my kids went to it because I believed in it. They were part of the military. They were, belonged to, uh, uh, were on active duty or belonged to the Guard. Because it, the responsibility and learning to work as a team and to trust somebody else because they've got knowledge and you've got knowledge between the two, you can accomplish this thing. Um, when you flew, did you always fly as the same team? Whether yes, yeah, generally, generally. You and another? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, on, the, on the airplane, you always had the, uh, unless somebody was sick or something happened or they got transferred, they fell. Uh, but you operated for a certain time, and then you came back, and then they were, uh, they they changed off uh, as you lost equipment or or, or crews because of action, or or uh, we lost as many people because of mechanical problems and so forth, you know, as you did of of uh, getting shot at or something. So like you, you said, they're just inventing a lot yeah, of this technology. So, you're using. so you really learned that you were had to rely on yourself. So if you had to do a walk around on an airplane, you really looked for stuff. Just because somebody else was assigned to keep that airplane up and stuff, uh, the, the the guy that was the uh, 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 in charge of that airplane might have been really concerned because they had an engine change or they had to do something and there were other things in the airplane that he just couldn't get to. And your job, you walked around to make sure that you didn't have a broken bolt in the elevator or something didn't happen and, and so you, you you really learned to do that uh, and you had to learn to rely on yourself but you had to learn to rely on other people so you had to have a lot of knowledge you just had to acquire knowledge you just couldn't have an arrow and that's probably the biggest thing that I learned and the amazing thing is you guys are just young kids yeah I, I got out the day before I was 21 it was all the biggest majority of people I met were 18 years old, 17, 18, 19 years old. Now, did you bring all your planes back, or did you did you have to put one in the drink? Yeah, we uh, we lost a number in the drink, yes. But, I mean, w ones that you were in, or what? Yeah, well, I had an unfortunate experience of having to, put, having to put one in because we had some problems and lost an elevator and um, got picked up by a destroyer, and I found out that I was just as happy to be a a carrier man and a destroyer man because I was tall and lanky and the hatches on that dang destroyer, the, 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 the bottom of the hatch was about, oh, I don't know, 15 inches off the deck and the top was only about five. And you had to stick your foot through and duck at the same time and it took me several days to learn to do that. Uh, I was sure banged up here and there. Yeah, I Wait, found out that... I got switch tapes here. Yeah, it's amazing nowadays how much it's changed. I guess I'm moving around too much for you. Here. No, you're fine. You're <laughs> fine. I have a monitor, so every so often you'll see me, I can kind of yeah. slide it back and forth and <laughs> do all that. So you, the the plane that you lost was, was because of a, a malfunction. Well, yeah, it had, uh, it had been hit with some uh, anti-aircraft fire. I didn't know it at the time. And... Uh, so we lost an elevator. So anyhow, we got. So we were on the, picked up by this destroyer because the carrier operator had two destroyers out in front and two in the back, so far back, and that they were they were the guards for submarines and stuff. And then one of them was assigned if uh, we lost, because we were, uh, you'd lose airplanes when they were taken off of the bow. They they'd lose power or something and go in the water and crash or or they couldn't make the fan tail because of uh, they were injured or shot and they were just barely making it and so they'd set it in the water and so they'd be picked up. But I found out exactly what I'm worth in this life and that though. I'm worth 50 gallons of ice cream. That's what the, that's what the destroyer charged the carrier to put me back aboard. Because the carrier was the only ones that had gee dunk stands that had ice cream and candy and stuff, you could go down there and have a have a Coke or have a, uh, at those days, the, the other ships didn't have it. And so they depended a lot on these, on the supply ships or the carriers. 
And so the carrier could make ice cream, and so they, they, it was ransom. But they got a hold of a crewman, it was ransom, and, it, and <laughs> that's what you're worth. How'd they transfer you? On a breeches boy. And if you'd been kind of snotty when you're on board, they always managed to dip your butt in the water as they pulled you to the ca Otherwise, the two ships had to, uh, especially the little ship, uh, when they had the line strung, it had to maintain tension on those lines so that they could haul you up. On the, you sat in a, in, a, in a seat, and it was a pulley. It's called a breeches boy, and they wheeled you up and took you in and up there, and, and there was somebody around the line. But they could always manage the skipper of the D to... Just sink it just enough to dip you in the water, and they loved to do that if they caught, oh, especially lieutenants or or uh, lieutenant commanders or somebody dip their butt in the water when they sent them back aboard. <laughs> yeah. So to pull you out of the water, did they, was it where they dragged the net and you grab on the net? To... No, we were in a little life raft and they just pulled us up alongside and took us up. So when you were going down, you knew you were taking your plane down. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the kid in the back seat, he already had the raft loose. The raft was in the back, and, and uh, he sat here. The twin uh, uh, 30s were behind him, and the, and the life raft was up here, and they had some other stuff over here, and they, and they had a handle on it. They could pull it, broke it, and then it, the clamshell opened up, and the raft came out and, and uh, took the... Because uh, I... Uh, went in, went, I blew a tire taken off and we went over the side into the thing and I was trying to figure out what was going on and this, the kid was, uh, my gunner was beating me on the head. Here was a raft floating along, he was trying to get me out and I guess I'd hit my head and so forth and I was, because we went off and then down in the water. And I assume it happens. Oh yeah, bingo, I mean, you know, because they put you on a catapult and, they, and the ship was going about 30 knots to get and that way they can fire you and get you up to about uh, 90 miles an hour by the time. And so that plus the the speed of the ship just puts you over the 100 mile the takeoff thing. And of course you're going out loaded, you full tank, and so that you, there is some sink as you come out. And uh, if you don't have full power, then you don't want to make it. I forget what, it was about 80 feet to the water from the flight deck. And they went off, and you had various ways to, to, to do things, depending on how you were briefed and what, and took off and flew around. And then you formed up in your four group and flew by the carrier and then went off and formed up. And what, what were your, when you were up flying usually, what was your duty? Were you guys out looking at other ships or islands? Uh, no, depending on what you were sent out to do. If you were sent out to look for ships because there were ships out there, uh, 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 freighters or uh, supply ships or whatever you're looking for. Uh, junks, they had lots of small boats that they uh, were using uh, to uh, ferry stuff around and they uh, didn't realize this was going on for a while and so they let those go by and, and pretty soon they realized that they were going to have to after, go off the, after the small stuff on the water. And uh, you had a, a, then you may have been gone out on a, most of the time you went out on a search pattern and you were just, you were looking for whatever was down there. So you flew at a certain altitude and a certain speed and went so far, and did a turn and, and went so far and did a turn, it was all timed. So you covered a search area and you had the, the airplanes were searching the, uh, all the quadrants around the carrier, you'd be out there there might be some, you might be out 100 miles, some of them 300 miles out. Excuse me, doing, doing search for, looking for, because they may have had reports from a submarine or from another boat or from uh, the Aussies had, uh, and, uh, had a lot of uh, coast watchers on those islands. And they would report activities and that would go through the thing and uh, get back. And so they, you, that's, they didn't have the intelligence system that they have nowadays. They relied on what people saw mostly. It just just bloody amazes you that the uh, uh, to look back at what's happened in the uh, in the last fifty years. I envy these kids that are in pre kindergarten almost that can run computers and so forth. They they can do that better than they can write. 
Uh, so you had, I mean, you had uh, eyewitness accounts, and you guys kind of had to put. The they always debriefed together. you afterwards. You went in, and you were debriefed, and asked what you saw and what you did, and time, and this type of thing. And then they took all these reports and the debrief, put them together, and then they made a report up for the uh, era, uh, the uh, uh, person that was in charge of intelligence, who then reported to the admiral in charge of the uh, whatever group you were in. And then this stuff was fed together, and they decided where the he decided then where ships are going to go, what they're going to do with this. And if it was other kind of intelligence, then that went on to somebody else via radio or something, uh, so that they could. Particularly if you're over islands and stuff, and you'd see, uh, you kept your eyes open for uh, uh, various kinds of cars and trucks and stuff uh, to see what they were. This is particularly true in Korea. Uh, we'd run the Peter Peter planes into photographic planes, and then they went in with, at the start, they had no uh, armament or anything, they just had cameras, and we'd send them in to take pictures because we were interested in what was on the roads. You could see the, uh, uh, the photos would come back, and you'd, they'd be, uh, you'd look at them through uh, uh, stereoscopic equipment, so you could see whether that was, what kind of an ox cart that was, or what kind of a truck that was, and you could measure them, and there certain measurements with a certain kind of truck or something or something else, wow. and you were looking for uh, tracks going down the road, going off just into the and they ended the woods where well, you know that there was a truck track, and so you were looking for camouflage then there and this kind of thing to see where the Chai Coms were, or the uh, North Korean. So uh, when you flew out off of the, the carrier, then a lot of times, even in World War II, you weren't out to destroy, you no, were out to... Look, mostly look. You're always looking to see what's going on, where the enemy was. Many, many hours of just flying around out there and, and nothing happened. And if something did, it was usually unusual. Uh, how long of a how long was a mission? Here? Oh, uh, uh, probably two and a half hours at the most. So that's got to be. That seems like the first time you launch off one of those. Well, you big practice. You, must be a, yeah, but you practice on the shore. They had regular places that, and and you learned to land. They had landing fields with cables strung out, and you learned to land there, and and you learned to uh, uh, take off. Uh, they didn't uh, have any catapults until I went aboard. The first thing was I was catapulted on a carrier. Now then afterwards, then they learned they they had catapults on the ground, so you could end this, you could get catapulted and stuff. Uh, and they had all kinds of ways of doing things, but they had to teach people in a hurry, take these kids out of them, teach them to fly, and then teach them to to be sailors. Uh, and did you have one time that when you left your carrier and, and you couldn't get back to it? Did I hear right on that? that well, yeah, they, they you landed at, uh, uh, we were doing uh, work in, <laughs> when it was a cashew outfit, we were on the East Coast at, um, uh, we were working with the Jeep carrier and and so and so forth and uh, uh, it got sunk and they uh, we, we British helped us out and we were, so we could get refueled and come back and stuff and it was uh, uh, they had submarines out in the North Atlantic they they did but that was another thing they had to develop was that the uh, all these jeep carriers because they. They, uh, they didn't have enough big aircraft carriers, and that was the only way they could get across the water is with the aircraft, because they didn't have any airfields to go to at that time like they do now. And so they developed these old uh, freighters and put decks on them, and that's where Henry Kaiser made his fortune and stuff. He developed, he built them from the ground up, Jeep carriers, and then they... Uh, they used them. They uh, they couldn't use them as regular airplanes. They they had the little fighters, the F uh, little three Wildcats, and then they had some torpedo, the uh, F uh, torpedo bombers, TBFs, uh, and then they developed those into they became just uh, air, places that haul, uh, carriers that hauled airplanes all over to, 
and this type of thing as they got along because they were inventing all this stuff as they went along. They just had no idea that. Uh, so it was fascinating for me, uh, especially looking back to, to, for that kind of an education. Because then I came back and realized that if I wanted to do things, I had to get, uh, just go do it, go to school and do it, you know. And uh, yeah, good training. Keep, keep, keep track of people because people were, were a real asset to you because you'd meet them all over and the, the, the result of being in the service, I had an opportunity to be all kinds of places in the world and, and go places. Um, is, there, is there a lot of it you want to forget? Or do you forget? I mean, yeah, you, 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 yeah. There's, there's things that you, you don't remember. Uh, like I've said some things here today that I, I, it recalled things, but I'm just not really excited about talking about it. Uh, particularly if you were really involved with somebody, a, a really good friend, and you like to go on liberty with them or do this or that, you know, and. Uh, because I can understand then how some of these people that where they have these drive-by shootings and stuff and people get killed that are not involved and somebody's taken from you. That's just not the way it should be. So do you yeah. want a survival mode then in war? I mean, it, you d I, you know, amazing minds. Yeah, that... you, you develop it, yes. Because after you get some training, you realize that you can take care of yourself, that somebody else is not going to take care of you that you have to rely on yourself and other people, particularly when certain jobs come along and you're put in charge of a job and you've got other people with you. You not only have to take care of yourself, but you've got to worry about these people out here too. And uh, if you got a new pilot on and they're assigned to your section, so you got to look out for them, you got to look out for yourself, and that makes you uh, twice. But you learn to... The, the old saying goes, don't sweat the small stuff, but the small stuff is is ingrained. You just learn to pick it up and do it. And if this little thing isn't done, you can understand why this guy got all hot and bothered and yelled and hollered at you because this little thing wasn't done. But it was very important that that little thing is part of something else. And you learn to pay attention. You learn to pay attention. And that's the biggest thing that... Uh, Kids got to learn. Is they yes, they have to be self reliant, but there's a lot of things they got to know in order to be self reliant. They just can't go out in the street and start taking care of themselves because somebody's going to take advantage of them right off the bat with this, that, and the other thing. Uh, the uh, I I learned that the hard way. I we were uh, through some. Uh, things that happened, we got assigned to the base for a week. And so this kid wanted to go ashore. So I loaned him my ID card. Never give it a thought to this. So he went off ashore and got himself in trouble. And so they hauled him in. And the first thing I know, in the middle of the night, I get a call, get my over to a certain place. And here's this lieutenant meets me and he says, what the hell are you doing ashore tonight? You went, I says, I didn't go ashore. He says, I got your ID card right here and, it's, and you were ashore and so forth down there at Norfolk. Well, then I was in real trouble because I had loaned my identification to somebody else so he could go do something. He was a married guy and his wife was there and stuff. And uh, I committed a worse sin than he did, you know. Uh, I think they gave him an award for outsmarting me or something, <laughs> but... Uh, that was, uh, that's the way things happened. But it, it was a lot of people and they, uh, I was amazed at the type of leadership we had or how the people came from another life and assumed leadership and were able to direct people and to do things. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays it's run more by politics than it is by people who understand the military, and this is just this bothers me, even though I spent a good part of my life in the military, and so have my kids. What do you think the do, do 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 you do you think that there's a message from World War II for the the generations to come that you and I I won't meet? Yeah. 
they haven't experienced having a need for something and having to work for that, whatever it is, as a, a car or something, kids understand it better. But nowadays, uh, they don't have to work for it that hard. I'm, I'm amazed that parents can give kids a $20 a week allowance and this type of thing. Uh, some of the kids had to work like heck to, to earn the, nowadays to earn their, to get a car, to drive to school and stuff. But uh, it was ama it's amazing to me that they got parking lot problems in high school. They never used to have that. We used to walk to school. Uh, we lived in a part of town uh, that we walked across. There was, uh, the Milwaukee Railroad ran diagonally through the town, and so we'd walk up the railroad track because it was the shortest way to get over to go to the high school at Great Falls. Well, they got so many kids, and then the, the old freight train would come through in the morning, and they'd have two or three boxcars, and, and the kids got so they'd hang on the boxcars and stuff, and the engineer was going, well, the railroad got smart, and they put a flat car on there just so the kids could get on the flat car, and they'd ride about 14, 18 blocks through the town up to where we got down, and they'd slow down and let us all off, and we walked to school. Well, they were being smart and they were saving lives and, and uh, because the kids never thought a thing about it. I mean, that was a, a expedient way to solve a problem. Huh. And now the expedient way to solve problems gets people in more, because there's so many people and because they, we just can't do the thing. But common sense. Talk, talk, common sense had taught you to be independent, to look out for yourself, but that you, if you did the right things, there were always people that could help you and would help you and you could rely on. Uh, but it shows you the big wide world outside, particularly beyond the confines of your own town and your own state because it amazes you how other people live because they think differently. They're different schools and this type. I remember the first time I went to overseas to the Mideast and stuff. Uh, and and uh, people were wearing, they didn't want the women to be seen and they wore, and we were briefed and, and, that we couldn't take pictures, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, you know, and that stuff. And it just comes back to you that these people have have never seen and been to your country. You've, they've, you've had better opportunity than they have and you've got to respect what they believe in and what they, how they live that they can't live you in. Uh, too often, just like that business with the t-shirts and stuff, we try to force our way of thinking onto somebody else when they don't have any understanding of what it is. Now that's what the kids got to learn nowadays, uh, that other people have uh, opportunity to live like they want to live or be raised that way, and, and they got to understand it. They can't force their methods on them unless they are going to match or there's an agreement. So, because you just, there's so darn many people in this nowadays it has got to have more agreement than they used to have. Yeah, crowded. Yeah, it's so crowded. What, what was the worst part of war for you? Or the hardest part? <sighs> Losing friends that were very close to you. Um, Seeing things, the first time you saw somebody that was badly hurt because of something, and you just didn't realize that. Uh, I've seen a lot you know, in car accidents and stuff. The first time you see somebody in a car accident whose arm is, is uh, you're, they're bleeding badly and they're all banged up and so forth. Uh, it's a, if you've never seen that before, it, it, you don't realize that it's real. And it's uh, it, it's hard to realize when that happens to somebody, and then you're talking to them, and then they're not there anymore. And and you and it's hard to realize that they're someplace else, that they're not ever going to be with you again. Uh, because one of the things that. Uh, they're trying to teach in the schools nowadays is, is teamwork, and they have and, tra and companies have spent lots of money uh, bringing people in to teach teamwork and how to work together and how to work. And that's the biggest thing that uh, we learned right off the bat in, in uh, 
World War II is they started right from the day in basic training of forming you into a group and getting used to each other. It was the worst shock in my life to go to Farragut over there and to stand up with all those guys I had never seen before and have to disrobe. I had never disrobed in front of anybody in my life before. I was from a good old Presbyterian family. You didn't do that, you know, even with five kids. And, to, and then to have this, the ignominy of having to be checked physically, to bend over and have somebody looking at you from the rear and have somebody looking at you from the front. And uh, it, that was a real shock to me at the first. And to, to learn to live uh, with that group of men, guys, they were men, 17, 18, I mean, who had from, from all walks of life, who were so different and talked different. They had different accents. I never realized we had an accent in the Northwest until I went in the service and people said, boy, you really got an accent, you know? And, that, and that even afterwards, I went to the University of Indiana to a study thing uh, some years back, and the, uh, the cab drivers, the three of us got off the airplane, and he says, boy, you guys are from the Northwest, I can tell by your accents. You know, and it just, it doesn't come home to you that they're different and you're different. I mean, you look at yourself, you're the same. And that's what happens when you're with people. You get close to them, you get to know them. Uh, and for a kid, you don't realize you get that emotionally bound up with somebody until something happens because you just become a friend. You talk to each other, you walk around, you go together. Because um, a lot of the kids, they never had a lot of friends because people, although you were lived in a neighborhood and this type of thing, you weren't as close because they lived up the block or down the block. And you went to school with them, you messed around a little bit and stuff. But here you're living together with them. You're in this bunk, and there's a guy in this bunk, and right across the way there's another guy, and they have different physical things. Uh, uh, they snore, they talk, they, and you've never been ex exposed to this. Uh, so it's it's uh, uh, it's it's there's a lot to be gained. I. I really feel badly for the kids that are forced to live on the street, so like in our town right here and this type of thing, who they haven't experienced life. They have no idea how to, to live, and that's why they're vulnerable to all kinds of scams and stuff, because they haven't learned to, they haven't had the, the mental education. And that's the thing that uh, I saw happen in World War II and in and, uh, and Korea after. Uh, you got the mental education, uh, they learn to live with people. That, that's the biggest thing that I think the, the, one of the big things the service got out of it is they, le they learned how to teach people to, to work together and live together. It was different than when they had the, uh, the uh, Army Corps and the platoons and stuff before the war because those people, they went out and recruited them and they were looking for a certain level of society to get the people from. But when World War II came along, all of a sudden, they had all kinds of highly educated people and, and lots of people that had high school. But even in my day when I high school, lots of kids did not finish high school. They went off to do other things. And the war came along and that was the first thing probably they said, you gotta finish high school because you gotta have this level of education if you want to do that. And I found that out when I wanted to do certain things. I had to prepare myself to get education. I had to read and do things. Uh, because if you went and asked somebody for a job, like I was nuts, I wanted to go fly. I, I was going to have to shoot guns or do this. And, that. and then somebody come along and said, well, do you know this to do this? Can you do this? And I found out that I had to do that. Uh, Living close to people is, uh, is a real eye-opener when they're, they're more than just people. They become really good friends and they have feelings and they have uh, uh, thoughts and stuff that, that intermingle and intermix with you. And they become, even though you and I weren't born to the same family and stuff, we become really family. And, and, and 
and that's the that's really the way it was. Because um, I assume you ended up living a lot of experiences and sharing. I mean, from from homesickness to girlfriends or wives back home to family back home to whatever they're facing, they're seasick, they're not what, and now you're this big, huge family all with this yeah. terrible thing, World War II going on with this common thing, but yet there's still this average right. everyday right. people. Right, right. Uh, and I guess that's the various experiences that you had were what really helped you grow up. Although you were protected, you were on the training basis, you were here, you were there, you, you went to the uh, uh, training classes together, you did certain things together, uh, and, and that's how you learned to think. It was amazing to me. Uh, I'd been a Boy Scout, and I'd learned in the, when I went to uh, when I was in uh, boot camp over there. I knew signal semaphore signaling, and I knew Morse code. Well, right off the bat, I was selected uh, to teach that to the guys. That was a real experience for me because I had a skill that was really needed. Uh, the same way with. Uh, uh, learning to run a compass. I'd run compass courses and stuff. And so I was out there to teach it to people. And it was amazing to me that there were other kids that never had had that experience. Uh, and that's and why it sounds I, like age becomes irrelevant at that yeah, point, too. It really I mean, I assume does. you were teaching some guys that oh, were Oh, that were 35 than... years old. And, uh, yeah, we were all mixed up in the, uh, in the thing. Um... Uh, so it became a matter of you listen to experience and you listen to experience because they had experienced it. I mean, it, you know, the, uh, I remember um, we were going through a identification class. Uh, they were showing us little models of airplanes that were made. It was a big cottage industry throughout people were kids were making these little airplanes given to the Navy and the Air Force and so they'd hold them up for a certain thing you had to get a guess at first until you got to know just looking at it. same way with ships certain ships certain thing you had to you had to know that fast and you had to learn it uh, and they didn't have time for you if you didn't pick that stuff up because they shifted you from uh, every, they assumed everybody could do this when they start out and then if you weren't right up to snuff on this thing, then you went to a different thing and a different thing. So you may have ended up cooking someplace or being a compartment cleaner or something, right? But a lot of the kids were not, ex uh, had, had not grown up with the idea that they could achieve more than, than what, where they were, what they could do. And so these opportunities are always presented out there. So you just say, boy, I can do that. I want to learn to do that. How do I learn to do that? And that was my first experience of using the outside experience when I was a kid to, in the service. Which you thought was every day average. That's right. Everybody must know right. this. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting when I talk to a lot of the veterans because, you know, your life is this much. And World War II was that this much. much of it, mm -hmm. but yet what it did, whether... Well, the impact it made because it took you out of a closed compartment where you were living over here and put you in a whole wide thing where you had to learn how to navigate yourself through it in a hurry and to do these things, and you had to uh, learn to do things that you never even knew about before. And you learned that you could do these things, you could rely on yourself, that you could pick up this information, and you learned to keep your eyes open because you were seeing things, and that, that put it up here. Uh, I remember I fought, I just, we learned the old Palmer method of writing in school. You had all these big circles and L's and all this thing. And the first thing I got in the service found out that you were somebody if you could write plainly. That made a big, and that separated the men from the boys, so to speak, that they could read your writing and you could do things. And that began to make an impression on me. It was the little things that counted that they expected you to be able to do. 
uh, it's uh, it's a real eye opener, and I don't know whether I fault a lot of the things, the parents and stuff. The kids, kids don't have that experience to to pick up all the little things. I, I'm a real advocate of scouting. I've been involved in it for years, and we had a, a post that did this, and and uh, we've hiked the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada, and and we've uh, uh, done a lot because it, it gives the kids an experience. I'm involved with the kids over at Gonzaga University in a Circle K program where it's a Kiwanis Bonus Service thing that gives kids from all over an opportunity to work together, same thing, and do something for somebody else and for the community. And it changes the way you think, and it makes you a different person. Instead of being so me-oriented and going right down the line, you've got to, and that's what the service did. It, all this stuff is out here on your peripheral vision. And you've got to be able to simulate it because you've got to use it sometime to, to help yourself. And that's, that's what's, I th the, a lot of the kids are missing nowadays, especially the ones that come from the bigger towns. Uh, I'm really impressed with the kids that come from the smaller towns to the Willamette University at Gonzaga because they have a whole different outlook on life than the kids that were raised <coughs> here in these high schools that have got 1,200, 2,500 in them. Yeah, they're still a, still a community. They're still a community, that's right. Now, uh, you, when, growing up, because that's kind of, because you grew up, I mean, World War II dramatically changed your life. Yeah. I mean, if, if, you know, you look at the what ifs, yep. what if World War II had, you know, where would I never would have been probably where I am now because I would never have had the opportunity to go to school when I did. If I, I wanted to go to school, I'd had to go out and work and work and work to earn money. Uh, I wasn't excited about getting married. I'd met a gal. I was in a play with her at the high school play. I was a junior. It was a senior play, and they needed somebody. And so she, this gal, who I didn't know very well, conned me into doing it. Well, she became a very dear friend. I eventually married her. And it was a, a, a whole thing that, that you were in this little community, and... You knew, even though we were, that was a big school at that time, we knew most of the kids in the class because we, we did a lot of things together. We played ball together and we did, uh, uh, played basketball and did a lot. Of, and in those day and age, all everybody, we did a lot of hunting. We went bird hunting, we went deer hunting, uh, went fishing. God, we were great fishermen. And you talk to kids and stuff now, they, now most of these kids have never been fishing in their life. They've never been hunting. They got this gun thing out here that they're scared to death with. But everything is tied up now. You, the, the places we used to hunt as a kid are all are all signs. There's no trespassing in this, unless you know the, know the land area because people step out of line to ease their own ego or something and create a, a hell hole for everybody else. You can't do this thing because they don't realize they got to learn to live together. Did did because uh, you come from what did you say Presbyterian background? Yeah. Did, did, was war ever a moral dilemma for you, or no. was that even an issue? It wasn't even an issue. It wasn't even an issue. I don't think it was an issue for a lot of people because this was something that the country was involved in, and everybody was involved in the country. Uh, there was a I think there was a really good view because of what. Um, Roosevelt had done with the NRA and the CCCs and, and all this other thing to bring the country out of its doldrums that had been in since the 29 crash. And things were happening. Uh, they were fixing the streets and they grading them, they oiled them, they sanded and oiled and there were people working for, on the WPA. And so people could see that the government was trying to help them or do something. And so maybe they were in favor then of helping the government when they needed, when this happened. Uh, we weren't very worldly wise in those days like they are now. I mean, the kid can go home and hear news of South Africa and to China and, and Great Britain and Antarctica. Uh, and it wasn't that way in those days because they, they just didn't have the... the so it's a, it's a matter of... Um, being wanting to learn and wanting to, to do these things and, and then to find out how to do them, just, you just can't 
Nobody's going to give them to you. They will if you ask and you, and you want them to mentor and they realize that you, that you really want their services and they'll feel good about helping you and training you and teaching you and this type of thing. But you just can't sit back and say, well, they owe it to me because they don't. Because you've got to... Uh, as I was, just to learn to be self -reliant. Every one of these old boys that I they're around now, they were all self-reliant. They learned it. They did all kinds of things on their own. And they had to go out and, and uh, do things to, in order to go to school. Uh, I'm Like today, I'm amazed at how many scholarships are available to kids if they want them. Go out and, and this group and that group and the other group, and there's 200 here and 300 there. And I've known kids going to the University of uh, uh, over Gonzaga over there to come in with thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 worth of scholarships, all built up from little 200 and 300. And, they, and as they went through school, they kept their track of things and where to go to get scholarship help. Yeah. And you can, so you can still do it and it's out there and there's help, but uh, you just can't sit back and expect it to happen. You gotta, you gotta participate in life. What's, uh, uh, this is a question I hadn't even thought about before for uh, other vets, but what's Memorial Day mean to you? Or v Veterans Day? Uh, it brings back memories, especially when certain music is played or certain things. I have not been a great one to participate in, at the graveyard and Veterans Day and stuff. It um, bothers me. Um, the um, Memorial Day, it, it's, it, it's, it's a... I like it because it's a day where well, I hate to say it this way, but nowadays people are forced to remember that something happened in their history that they shouldn't forget. Uh, Veterans Day is, is a recognition of, uh, of something that, that happened that people dedicated themselves to uh, that they don't do much. Nowadays it's the bottom line. It's the almighty buck. How much money can I make or, or what can I do? It's not... Uh, or now it's got to the point, not what can I do for the, my country, but what can my country do for me? I mean, would it give me this and give me that? And uh, I was amazed when I was in the guard out there finding out they were, they were talking to kids. They were fourth generation uh, Me Tours. I mean, they'd been on, uh, the, the great grandfather had been on uh, uh, help and uh, food stamps and their dad and their grandfather and their dad and they were. And they had no idea there was any other way to live, really, than to get this stuff. Uh, That's interesting. You said that, that uh, uh, cause all of a sudden I could start hearing a song in my, you said that, that sometimes a, a song or something will... Uh, trigger I mean, you. And right away I start hearing a little Glenn Miller right, band going right. or something. Yep. So it, it, does that, I mean, 50 years later, is, is that the type of thing that, that, that a song or somebody looks like somebody, or something will trigger something? And, yep. The other night we went to the uh, uh, symphony where they had five by design down at the uh, opera house. And these are people, and it was all 40s, 50s music. And uh, they sang just like the, uh, they, the songs were sung in those days by the people they did. And they had a story that went along with it and the music. And I was enthralled because it took me back to an era of time that the kids nowadays wouldn't even know. They're going to remember the songs and stuff that now, if they, if they're worth remembering, but the songs they did then were worth remembering. That Bing Crosby sang and Glenn Miller played and and Bill and Bob Crosby played and Tex Beneke and these people and uh, and uh, uh, it was a, a much more smooth, laid back. It was contemplative music or something that. Nowadays, uh, I have trouble listening because it's, it's just so much noise and they, you don't understand the words. And then when you do, uh, they repeat them and re I don't understand. It's, uh, when, when you hear the music when you went to this thing, is it the type of thing where all of a sudden a whole movie starts? Yeah, or you remember a dance you went to with a particular gal, or you remember a picnic you went to, or you remember driving someplace and you heard this on the car radio. Uh, 
it was a slower period of time. You had more time to, to think and stuff. It was, uh, it was neater to take a girl out in those days with the slower music. You could go to a dance and you weren't, sure there was jitterbugging and we jitterbugged, but you really liked the slow dancing too, to kind of cuddle up and dance because it, the, the two of you and, and uh, she smelled good. Uh, and it was just nice, nice to be with him. In lots of cases, we were talking the other night, sitting there listening to that. She, my my mother would take us to dances. I had a date with the, my, the gal that's my wife, and we parents would take us because I I didn't drive, and not until I got into the service and came back, and then I had to watch because they had gas stamps and so forth, and I couldn't get out and ram around and. You couldn't even vote when you came back. Lord, no, I couldn't vote until I was 21. Uh, 21. Huh. So was it your high school sweetheart you married? Yep. yep. So did you, uh, while you were overseas? No, we never, We got married when I came back. And but I mean, did you correspond? Oh, yes, off and on. I wasn't that great a corresponder. My mother gave me a camera to take pictures, and I lost it someplace. I was never one to take pictures in those days of, of uh, some of these guys got all kinds of pictures, you know, and I think back, well, I did this, and I don't have pictures of that or this or the other thing, you know. But it just, it wasn't important at that time to take pictures and, uh, it, to me because I'd not lived in an era where you had pictures to remind you. There were a few pictures. They were special pictures of Grandma and Grandpa because they were professionally taken or something. But you just didn't have a camera, the fa average family didn't, to run around and take pictures with, you know. And so that was just wasn't part of my makeup. And yet there were people around, uh, like you was talking about doing things you wanted to. I built model airplanes and flew, and so when we got on board, we flew U-Control on the carrier. Yeah, I, I remember we got in such a, oh boy, where I, it was I and some other guys in hot. We built the model of a Seagull. It's a single float in airplane. Well, when uh, we I was a friends of the photographers made on board the carrier, and so we saw this picture. We weren't supposed to see it, but we were looking through. It. Well, that's neat. Well, so we drew up plans and built one on board the carrier, and we're out flying this thing on the Fantail, one of the carriers uh, uh, anchored, you know, and and uh, so, and so they also had uh, shotguns so you could shoot skeet off the deck and certain recreation things. Well, we're flying this thing, and this admiral comes aboard and saw this airplane. Where in the hell did you get that? Oh, that's secret. You can't. Didn't make any difference to us. We weren't telling it. We were just building a model of this secret airplane, and we're, and we're flying it, you know, in a circle of U-control on the carrier. Cause we had a little hobby room that uh, down in the carpenter shop that they let us build in. We could store stuff, and so we built all our own wood and everything else because you didn't have any kits or anything else. And uh, managed to get our engine shipped to it. it was from home, a little model engine. And uh, But that's that's things that you did uh, uh, to, to have your own entertainment and to follow your interests and so forth, you know. Uh, so there's a war going on and, and you're building remote control planes. That's right. I mean, so that's, I mean, that is the... The surrealist uh, surrealism, or the, the the real. I mean, life goes on. Right. Yeah, and your interests and your hobbies and things, you know, uh, because they didn't have the record collections. You had records in those days. These kids never heard of seventy-eight RPM records, you know, big things, and you had collections. Oh, now and then they went to CDs, and now they're chips, so to speak. Uh, the uh, so you had to do with what fit in the area that you could. And, uh, so those that, uh, those that did a lot of uh, get done hunting, we get to shoot skeet off the fantail with the, and it was really neat to beat some guy that was a full commander or something, thought he was a hot shot with a shotgun from a back east club, you know, and go out there and, and knock down 15 more birds than he did and stuff. But yeah, that's, that was life. And that that was the growing together to realize that uh, the people from this section of the country were just as good as the people from that section or this section. 
we'd been raised different, but we all had the same mores and the way we had feel. Because there was a lot deeper feeling about the country than there is now. Uh, you get overseas now and you see the way the Americans act and it bothers me terribly. They go over there, the big IT, I'm it. Um, shouldn't be that way, but it's money and and uh, our position in the world. I don't mean to, maybe shouldn't be moralizing in this time, but I'm, you begin to recognize these things after you've been around because these other, again, the whole thing is that we're becoming a one world community. Yeah, it didn't used to be that way because people never, never traveled in the start of World War II. Very few people were able to go any place or do anything. And then it became the norm. The uh, and now it's the expected. It's the expected. Yeah. It's the expected. No, the uh, that's been interesting. I, uh, good Lord, I've taken up more of your I'm time. Just, I'm just peeking there because I got the. Yeah, I, uh, that you call thing. it when you want to. I, 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 let me just check to see what time I lose track during the day. What time my next. Uh, yeah, just about ready. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You know, it was it's it's always interesting to get different um, different perspective. I know there's a lot of it. Just talking to you, that I know there's a lot of it that you want. I can see you want to forget. It's, mm. It was tragedy, and and that's hard. And I don't know why it is, but it's just the kind of person I am. It doesn't. Uh, sure, I still think of these. Some of these at various times, or you'll have dreams or something, you know, and uh, you remember them. But as you grow older, I still remember them when they were this physical thing. I've got some dear old friends that I see off and on that were way could go way back in the military, and I look at hell, they look just like me. I mean, they're gray haired and they're old and they're getting pudgy and their stuff and and. Uh, I remember when they were young and lean and lean and and uh, uh, but you change. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Like I tell my wife, I said, my big problem is I'm not growing old gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> <Darn>. But at least you get a go you know. I didn't even think about that. I, 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 I can't even remember who I was talking to now, and it was a thing where years later. He had served with somebody who he lost mm -hmm. over there, and years later he had, he ran into relatives or parents or something like that, mm -hmm. and they were talking about the person he lost. And he said the hardest thing to remember was is it, it, because everybody else had grown up, but he still oh no it was a teacher that was it. Yeah. She still saw him as this sixteen year old kid, yeah. Yeah. and that's who she all he always would be to her. He right. never ever ever grew up. And when they would talk about this soldier. She just kept saying, oh, he was just a 16-year-old boy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, everybody survives differently. Yeah, it's it's really true. I take people out of context. My wife and I got married, and um, I had uh, <coughs> this little old Plymouth coop that I'd bought from uh, the fraternity at Missoula, and uh, a little and two, and we were going to go... And I had this secret honeymoon plan there. I didn't want people. Geez, I got in there and they had had it salted with rice and everything else and it ran out the door. So we got to Glacier Park and I pulled up to Mini Glacier there. And here stands this woman, arms like this, tapping her foot at the head of the stairs. Where have you been? You're late. And I looked at her. My God, that's my English teacher from high school, Miss O'Leary. She was the summer meter d or whatever you want to call it there ran the hotel and she had seen the uh, slip the thing and here she was well you can t know I, I saw her in a completely different context she had us jobbed from the you know thing it, i would go to their hotel room and pretty soon there'd be, there'd be dog, and there'd be somebody come by and knock on the door when the bell off uh looking back now it was the most marvelous thing but and she was a, but i never saw her in that light at high school she taught English and German, and boy, you had to. She expected you to perform, and it was really neat to to see her in that thing you talked about. 
And uh, I always see her now. I, that's, I, I envision her standing up there. To, that's the only way I remember her. I can't really remember her in the, cl in the classroom and afterwards. But you're right. And then I, um, I certain times you we were talking and reminded me of other things to see these kids. As they were then, I have no idea where they are now, whether they were killed during the war or they survived because there were so many things that went on. Uh, but I get together with all these old guys in Troy and then to, uh, we start talking and they start talking and that reminds you of things. I've, I've met guys there now that I hadn't seen for 55, 60 years that, that we get to talking and they were there and they were in and I suddenly remember, well, there was a kid or something back there like then that, that was who this guy was, you know, just blows your mind, just blows your mind. But I really feel that it's, uh, I'm glad to see that uh, more and more of the high schools are demanding service for the kids to graduate and stuff because they've got to learn that there's not all these haves and have, there's so many have nots even though they have that they've got to help the other people because that's, that's one big thing. I, you know, there's Habitat for Humanity, what Jimmy Carter's doing and, and, and uh, working and doing things.